What's going on, everybody? It is Max the Catfish, and we are back with episode five of our Stellaris Beginner's Tutorial for 2022. If you're watching this far, thank you so much for watching, for real. The feedback I've received from all of you over the course of the series has been really motivating and really great. And I really appreciate the support, for real. Let's get into it. We are taking a look at factions. At the end of our last episode, we had these two pop-ups appear on the screen, and there's a lot of text here, right? When you're reading some of these pop-ups, a really quick indicator of what is important and what you can kind of skim over is the text that is written in yellow, and maybe the text that surrounds that, right? So on our screen right now, we've got two pop-ups. They happen simultaneously. And they have let us know that a new faction has been created. It's gaining traction in our empire. We've got a faction on the left here called the Xeno Justice Group. And we've got a faction on the right known as the Democratic Rights Committee. Now, justice and democratic rights, those two things actually seem pretty aligned. So we might even be so lucky that these two factions want the same Thing. Now, if we think about politics in the real world, there are different factions, political factions in a particular country or in a particular region of the world. And those factions in real life, just like in Solaris, have something that they want. They want something from you. They want to run the, the empire a certain way. They have certain um, expectations of what it's like to live in your empire. And these needs and expectations, if met, will bring you an increase of influence. Future Max here. Factions actually generate unity for you. They don't generate influence anymore. They used to, actually for, for a long time they used to, but not anymore. So you'll learn that in a little bit, but just wanted to clear that up in case anybody's going, whoa, whoa, don't hit me with the comet bomb yet. It actually kind of is pretty thematic in that way, right? The more you appease your factions, the more you give them what they want, the more influence they will give you in return. And you can wield that influence against larger entities in space, opposing entities in space. Remember, influence is really important for taking new space, new territories, not only for building out your empire and taking more systems, but also for making claims on your enemy's systems, which is a primary way, I totally just spit everywhere. It is a primary way that empires will battle each other for portions of space, is to claim other territories, to say, hey, that's mine. I may never have owned it. I, I, I may have just found it, but I want it. I'm gonna take it. And if you are playing a more warfare oriented empire, which many of you are, claims are fundamental to how you start and engage and actually win something from wars. Let's meet a couple of our aliens. Let's meet our factions and talk about factions and appeasing them. And then let's kind of branch out a little bit and talk a little bit about diplomacy as well. Cool? Cool. So. Uh, we've got these two factions. You can see your factions by default in your outliner on the right side. I think there's also a factions bar on the left side menu if you want to open that up instead. Either way, totally fine. They bring you to the same place. Our two factions here, we can even see a couple of, a lot of information here. We only have two, which we're actually kind of lucky about. Some empires start with three. In fact, factions are primarily based on your empire's ethics to begin with, right? As the ethics of your empire shift and change, they start to breed new factions. So if you have a egalitarian and a xenophilic empire like ours, right? You have very centralized or very focused factions. We are focused on equality and welcoming aliens into the fold, welcoming them into our empire. If you have a empire that has a diverse set of factions, these things might be fighting over each other for different elements of your space. You can't always appease them all the time. So if we click on a faction in the outliner, let's take a look at what they want. Xeno Justice Group, we have a 33% of our population is part of the Xeno Justice Group. And this is actually going to increase as I unpause, we're going to see the population kind of choose sides, right? Our pops are, are just finding out these factions to begin with, and they're deciding which of the two they really support. So 36% support the Xeno Justice Group, 63% support the Democratic Rights Committee. And 
This will let you know how important is it for you to appease this faction. Do you really care? If 1% of your population wants you to be a brutal, warmongering, mass murder machine, are you going to try to do that to appease them when 99% of your empire doesn't care about that? Probably a bad idea. So instead, first take a look at your support percentages just to get a sense of, hey, how many people actually you know, are part of this. Now, I misspoke earlier. It used to be that factions generated influence for you, but actually they don't anymore. And this is a big change in Stellaris. Factions generate unity, which actually makes your job and my job a lot easier because when it was, when it affected influence, it was a much, much, much bigger deal. So we're lucky in that way. You can use this to get a little bit more unity. Remember, unity is going to generate you more traditions. These little, uh, let's, let's go to the left side first and then we'll talk about the pips. The approval numbers are how supportive are the factions of you? How much have you done to appease your factions in your empire? Okay, and this number is generally based on the happiness of your population across your entire empire and whether you have actually addressed the issues of each one of these factions. These issues, these pips will let you know if you are actually running your empire the way that the faction expects you to do so. And you can see on the left side here under issues, what each issue is and what you can do to, uh, to support it, to actually remedy it for each faction. So the Xeno Justice Group, remember this is our, our, we want justice not only for ourselves, but we want justice for every alien out there in the galaxy, which means we don't want you to purge or kill aliens just because you don't like them. We haven't done that, so we're appeasing the Xeno Justice Group in that one issue. But we haven't really met another alien. We haven't met another empire. And because of that, the Xeno Justice Group is a little bit disappointed in us. Like, why aren't we going out there and meeting others, right? If we make a new contact with another empire out there in the galaxy, we'll see that this issue is resolved and the Xeno Justice Group's approval of us will increase, which in effect will improve and increase the amount of unity that they gain us. Uh, stuff like proactive first contact protocols. Remember at the very, very beginning of the tutorial series, we talked about setting your first contact protocol. How are we actually um, opening our arms to aliens or are we closing ourselves off to them? Or maybe somewhere in the middle, maybe we're just being kind of cautious. That is uh, the choice that we made has not really made the, uh, the Xeno Justice group very happy. They would rather we welcome aliens with open arms. Come on in. We're, we're, we will welcome you 100%. And this is something that we might even be able to fix right now. Okay, let's take a look at policies. So we looked at policies during the last tutorial video because we had that issue where the resettlement box on our planet was actually grayed out. It was grayed out because our empire believes that it is not the government's right to tell a population which planet you should live on. We can't tell you what to do, right? You are free to move about our empire however you please, but we can't force you to do it. That is one of many policies. One of the policies that we set at the very beginning was our first pro contact protocol. And we were actually proposed with this in a pop-up, but most of your policies have to be set manually. And at the start of the game, they're actually set by default based on the ethics that you've chosen, sometimes based on the civics that you've chosen. There's a variety of, of different elements that determine what your starting policies look like. So in the policies tab here, You'll notice that first contact protocol is a policy that we can change, but we can't change it now. And that's because just like any stable government in the world, we can't go on and say, hey, you know, one year, hey, uh, the government says we can't force you to move anywhere. And then the next year, no, 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 we can force you to move anywhere. And then the next year, you know what? We've chose, we've taken that back. We changed our mind. We can't force you to move anywhere. This would create a pretty disruptive society. So every policy change that you make can only be changed after 10 years, okay? So if you make a change now, you're gonna have to wait 10 years to make another change to that same policy. Policies include not just the first contact protocol, which I would like to change, so I'm gonna unpause the game, 
but also stuff like your diplomatic stance, right? What is the core foundation of why we even exist in the galaxy? Like, what, what are we doing right now? To start, we are expansionists. We are trying to expand our borders. And we do that by taking our construction ships and moving them around and building star bases, right? The policy of expansionist is actually reducing the cost of building outposts and it is increasing the speed of making new colony ships, which I have to do for a planet on Sirius here, Sirius 3. Remember, we've got to click colonize, send a ship, we can name our colony and let that happen in the background. Uh, there, are there are policies for your war philosophy. Are we kind of open to war? Like, are we just kind of going to take some, some, you know, some space and that's just going to happen and, and that's who we are? Or are we only going to involve ourselves in defensive wars that protect our empire, where we don't go on the aggressive ever? In fact, taking defensive wars prevents us from claiming systems. And the only time we can claim systems if, is if we are the target of a war by a warfaring nation. These policies have massive, massive impacts on what you can and cannot do, or what you generate in terms of resources and what you can't generate in terms of resources. So it's worth taking a look at these and making sure that they're aligned to how you wanna play the game. This is one of the first things that advanced players go to, and they make sure that their pol policies are in order because they actually do have a pretty big effect. One of the biggest effects is your economic policy. And this determines whether you have penalties or bonuses to the production of those advanced resources, namely to consumer goods and to alloys. If you are going to play a pretty peaceful, positive, you're not really gonna get very aggressive. You don't really need to do much expansion. You wanna play what, what people call tall, which is, you know, a small empire. You don't wanna go to war. You don't wanna trash people. You might wanna choose the civilian economy. This is going to generate a lot more consumer goods. And remember, we can turn consumer goods into unity. We can turn consumer goods into, is it science? It is science. We can turn consumer goods into science. Setting the policy for, for your economic policy to civilian economy will reduce the number of alloys you create, but they will massively increase the number of consumer goods. Technically, it's the same on both sides, right? Similarly, if you want to be a warfaring nation and war is on the mind, you might want to choose a militarized economy. This is an economy that focuses much more on building those hard alloys that we use in ship construction and starbase construction. And in so doing, we deprioritize the construction of consumer goods. So maybe, and this likely happens, our technology suffers a little bit. Our unity suffers a little bit. Instead of trying to create unity, we're actually trying to make it take as much space as possible, right? It's a totally viable way to win the game. Uh, it's up to you to decide which of these you choose. Just remember, when you make this decision, if you change any of these policies in this list, you cannot change that specific policy for 10 years. So that's a decent amount of time. In this tutorial, I have actually only let 12 years pass. That is how much is going on in this game at the very beginning. That's one of the reasons why Stellaris is a pretty overwhelming game for beginners when they first start off. But you have basically almost all of the building blocks you need now to start out in the galaxy. The things we haven't talked about are diplomacy and warfare. Those are the two really big ones. And we're going to get into that soon. The last one that might be worth knowing about is your trade policy. And I actually have a couple of examples of what that looks like. I want to show you right now what that means because we haven't talked about trade. So our construction ships are going around space. They're building star bases. Um, I've got a couple of, of pop-ups. I'm going to kind of ignore this and uh, and move on. I'll let you figure out what the odd factory is and deal with it in your own, in your own playthrough. Uh, but we've got a couple of systems around here and there are some recognizable icons here. Remember, if an icon is below a system, it means you haven't gathered the resources from that system yet. And you can always press the Alt key, the left Alt or, oh, right, Alt 2, to see if, uh, if there are any any of these resources that you have already exploited. Anything in green, you've already built a mining station or a research station over. Anything in white still needs to happen. There is, however, an icon here that may look familiar, but is not any of the icons we've talked about previously. And that is 
the trade value of this system. This system has something about it that is not only valuable, but is sort of maybe not valuable to building an empire. It's more valuable to trade it to other people, to give it to your populace, to use it as a token of exchange. Trade value is gathered not by building mining stations. You'll notice if I unpause this and I just let this uh, this construction ship build all of the, oh God, the odd factory is really giving us trouble. Uh, to go around and build all these mining stations, it won't actually gather the trade value from the system. And that's because trade value is not gathered from mining it or from researching it. It is gathered from collecting it, okay? Now, how do you collect it? First, just for those of you that are watching and going, oh God, please choose tech, please choose tech. I'm gonna just choose a couple here. Um, just from a quick choice here, army damage and minerals from jobs is a pretty good one to grab. It's pretty nice and it gives you some pretty strong bonuses across your empire. And then for our society research, I see two that I really want. The gene clinics will increase our pop growth speed, which we talked about in the last tutorial. The planetary unification will give us a bunch of unity and unlock some new edicts. As much as I want pop growth speed, I'm probably gonna take the uh, planetary unification. Actually, you know what? I take that back. Let's go gene clinics. It's kind of a fun way of, of, uh, of directing our empire. We'll take the gene clinics. That's gonna be 49 months from now. But you'll notice that on this system, our construction ship has finished all of its work. And yet still, there is an icon underneath here called trade value that we haven't exploited. Like what the heck, what's going on? Trade value is collected from star bases. Just like a star base can be designed to build ships as a shipyard, it can instead, or in addition, be designed as a trade hub, which is a module that you can put on a star base that will collect trade value from the systems based on the distance away from that star base, okay? So each trade hub that you build will increase the collection of trade value by one and it will collect that trade and convert that trade into a resource based on what your policy is. So our default trade policy is wealth creation. For every single trade value that we collect, we convert that trade directly into energy credits. If you play a different empire or if you get different technologies or traditions, you may receive policies that give you different resources for, for trade. So just like the economic policy where we decided whether we should build more consumer goods or alloys, there is value in checking out the trade policy and seeing if you have different options there. Remember, this can be very swingy. So changing your trade policy from wealth creation to something else can have a drastic impact on how much energy credits you are generating. A really quick way of checking what effect that will have, and then you can do some mental math or some math on paper, is to go and hover over your energy credits in the upper left-hand corner, and you can even see how many energy credits are we generating from trade, right? Based on our trade policy, we can assume that if every single trade value earns us one energy, then if we are generating 45.90 energy credits from trade, we are also collecting 45.90 trade value, right? And in fact, uh, that's basically exactly what we're, we're gathering. I couldn't tell you where the 1.5 or 1.9 that's missing is, but we have 44 trade value in the soul system and we're gathering that because our trade hub is located on that system. Pretty nifty. If I want to gather the trade in this system, I need to build one more trade hub. Now, I'm gonna do this because this is a tutorial, but I'm gonna tell you right now, this is a very bad idea. I am going to replace my shipyard with a trade hub so I can show you how it works. This is not recommended, please don't do this. If you don't have a shipyard, you can't build defensive ships, you can't build offensive ships, you can't build new construction ships or new uh, scientific ships. So just know that in mind, this is not how you should play the game, but I'm gonna show this to you because it's pretty important to do. Just like building buildings on planets, you can build uh, modules inside of a starbase, as long as that starbase is upgraded. And 
By upgrading that star base, you will automatically be able to build two modules and one building. These were automatically created for us actually at the start of the game. We didn't make these, they're given to you when you first start. And uh, you can change these modules around, you can experiment with them. There are different use cases for having different modules on different star bases based on where you place them. I'm gonna show you that in a sec too. But for now, I'm gonna upgrade uh, and rather retrofit our shipyard into a trade hub. Bad idea, but we're gonna do it because this is a tutorial and you should know how it works. In 100 days or cycles, we're going to see that these three trade value here disappear. And it's because our trade hub has increased its collection range by one. There it is. And has gathered the trade from that system. And in about, actually instantly, we can see that our trade value has increased to 49.17. There it is. That's as easy as it gets. Trade is actually pretty simple when you think about it, but there is a hidden mechanic that you should know about. Trade value is actually transferred from a star base to your capital system, okay? It's transferred there. It's not something that happens instantly like energy credits or minerals or food. It doesn't appear to you that it is transferred, but it actually is. And I'll show you exactly how that is. I'm going to actually go back here, change this trade hub into a shipyard, and I'm going to go on to Naranka and upgrade our starport, or sorry, upgrade our outpost to a starport. What I'm doing is I'm building a new starport or a new star base so that I can build some modules on. Remember, by default, you start with an outpost here because you've taken this, this system, but you can't actually build any modules on it unless you upgrade it into a starport and beyond. There is a limit to the number of starports that you can build. And just like keeping an eye on the numbers on your planets, you should always keep an eye on the numbers at the top of your screen there. This icon here, your starbase capacity, tells you how many starbases you can have. And it's there because if you could build a starbase in every single system in the game, nobody could ever defeat you, right? It would be really obnoxious, it'd be really annoying. Starbases, just like ships, have a firepower attached to them. So if ships come in here to the starbase, 149 is very, 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 very laughably low, but the starbase kind of shoots back, little pew pews back at the enemies, right? Uh, when it's upgraded to a starport, it starts to gain some defensive capabilities. You'll notice that our star base, or sorry, our star port in our soul system has 509 combat power. So it's a little bit stronger than a typical, um, a typical outpost is. I'm going to choose, oh, you know what? Let's wait on that. I've got something to show you in a sec. I'm going to take automatic surveying from our physics technology. We're going to talk about the tradition in just a second here. But our starbase in 100 cycles is going to be upgraded from an outpost to a starport. And that's gonna allow us to create some modules on it. Give that a second. Boom. Now something happened that maybe you didn't expect. We didn't build a trade hub, but the trade value in the system was, was gathered. And that is because starports, when built on a system, will gather the trade value in their own system. Trade hubs are actually only required to gather trade value outside of the system that the starport is built in. So this trade hub has been built, or sorry, the starport has been built on a system with some trade value. And what's happening beneath the surface is that has created a trade route. If you click on your star base and you click trade routes under modules, this is like super hidden. I don't know why it's so, vague and, and kind of like, like almost nondescript. But if you click on trade routes, you'll notice that there are a line, there's a line that's going from this system through Barnard Star and over to Seoul. Now it's going to Seoul because you can only actually benefit from trade if the trade gets to your capital system, okay? It has to get to your capital system. And when it reaches your capital system, it actually generates you whatever your trade generates you. That creates a path where the trade value is under the surface. You don't actually have to do anything or set this up, but under the surface, it is sending the trade via these tiny little cargo ships that are undefended through your hyperlanes, through systems, back to your home planet. Now, that sounds great. 
we're getting energy credits from the trade. Like that's that's fantastic. We're we're we're, we're benefiting from it. But in this trade routes uh, little view here, you'll notice that there's an icon that looks a little bit scary. It's the piracy icon. Piracy, just like it would in real life back in the day of, of naval pirates, pirates will start to target trade routes that are very valuable. Makes sense, right? Undefended cargo ships bringing different resources from one place to another with no military escort. That sounds great to go and raid and take out. And pirates will do that. After a certain amount of time, if you don't defend this trade route with ships, literally with actually placing ships or by building some, some special buildings on your star bases, pirates will actually revolt against you and will start to break down your trade routes and will actually take your systems from you. And you have to fight them and take them back. To prevent that, you can do a couple of different things, but the easiest thing to do is actually to take a, a small fleet and just send them there. Like pirates aren't gonna start, you know, start crap where there's a ship or a fleet of ships that are gonna shoot them back, right? Pirates are pretty, pirates are pretty, uh, are pretty puny in this game. So keeping ships here is a great thing to do because this is a very short trade route, right? We're only actually going two systems. We're going from uh, Naranka to Seoul, two systems away. Pirates probably won't be generated here. In fact, I wouldn't even recommend that you place a, a starport here just for the trade. It's better to use this as maybe a defensive position, right? Because we kind of see some choke points here as a way to prevent people from getting into your inner sanctum of your empire. But that said, um, while this will prevent pirates in this case, let's pretend that we had a trade route that spans from a system far away and has to make it to your capital system. Now, there's a lot of systems that piracy may, may be generated in, and it's not enough to just have a couple of corvettes in a single system because pirates are going to start up in another system down the chain, right? You can actually set up patrols with your starting ships. Now, this is kind of a later like mid game thing to do, but worth knowing. You can set up patrols with your uh, with your starting ships and they will patrol any two systems and, and fly between any two systems that you ask them to fly to. So in this case, I could actually set this up now and we could say, I want my little Corvettes to patrol from Naranka to Seoul. I can tell you right now, it's not really worth doing this at this point. Free trade value isn't that much. Pirates don't really care about that, but the bigger your empire gets, the more of a trouble pirates will be for you, especially if you depend on trade. So setting up these patrols to let your ships go between systems, a very valuable thing to do, and it will reduce the amount of piracy and the potential for pirates to take over your systems. Now, uh, we did all that. I'm going to take this system down. I'm going to downgrade this. Remember, if you exceed your starbase capacity, bad things happen. You'll start to pay a lot more for your starbases. Starbases, just like buildings, have a cost to them. They have an upkeep. So probably a good idea to build starbases only really where you need them. Okay, just worth knowing. Uh, there's a great position for a starbase up here on Asteria. And we talked about how this was a fantastic defensive choke point. It really is. Now, how do we defend it? We can do it by building a starport here. So I'm actually going to upgrade this one, spend the alloys to do that. And we're going to put this as a pretty bulky defensive position for us. We're going to put some defensive locations, some guns and turrets so that we increase its potential for defending against opponent attacks if we have an aggressive neighbor or just an incursion that comes in on our empire. So that starport there is going to be one of our uh, two primary defensive positions that we use. Uh, but while we were explaining that, while we were explaining trade value, something popped up and I said, I want to come back to this because it's actually kind of important. And that is taking the last tradition in a tradition tree. You'll notice that you can choose a total of seven traditions, but there's this last box in the eighth position here called Ascension Perks. These are powerful one-time bonuses, sorry, not one-time, permanent bonuses to your entire empire. And more than probably anything in the game, maybe, maybe second to technology, I would even say more than technology, they determine what kind of a story your empire will have. Now, you only unlock Ascension perks when you complete a tradition tree. So if you want to get all eight Ascension perks, you're going to have to finish 
all seven of your tradition trees. You'll get one ascension perk for free through a technology later in the tech tree. But for now, we're going to choose the databank uplinks tradition, and we're going to get three things. Do you know what they are already? You might. We're going to get Database, up, databank uplinks, and that's going to give us a, a, an edict and some increase to our research station output, which is nice. Second thing is we are going to get the finisher effect of the discovery tree, which isn't made very clear to you. It would be better if there was like a little box here that got, went, hey, cool, you got that. Like you're finished. Uh, but completing that is going to increase our research speed by 10%. And the third thing we're going to get is an Ascension perk. If we click on this, you are presented with a big old list of objects here. A lot, a lot of items. And these things are going to determine which way your empire will lean. What is their story? Who are you, right? And what do you want to accomplish? In the base game, I'm gonna get a little bit biased here. In the base game, I would say that this list of Ascension perks is not really that interesting. Let me just be honest, it's not that interesting. Here we get things like, uh, like okay, we can reduce the, the amount that it costs for us to build star bases and to claim our opponent's space. That's pretty nice if you wanna be warfare oriented. Uh, we've got technological ascendancy, which I would recommend everybody takes as their first one. That's usually a pretty strong choice to make. It increases our research speed and it gives us the opportunity to research rare research, uh, researches 1.5% more often, which is actually, oh, sorry. Technically it's 1.5 times, but because the default rate of rare research is 1%, it turns that to 1.5%. It's a pretty strong thing, even though 0.5% doesn't seem that important. Think about how often you're, you're gaining new research, right? Uh, one vision is pretty good for unity builds. It gives you a lot more unity for your empire, which is pretty sweet if you're building a more peaceful, tall empire rather than building wide. And then some of these other ones are just kind of interesting. They could be fun to play around with, but I wouldn't recommend them. Mastery of Nature gives you some options to have uh, bigger planets, sort of, in a way. You can read about how that works and what that looks like. Um, Imperial Prerogative will reduce your empire size, which we haven't talked about too much, but it's this icon here at the top, which determines how quickly you generate research and how quickly you generate unity. Having too big of an empire will actually slow those two things down because it is a lot harder for you to organize a wide, massive, sprawling empire and distribute the technology to it than it is for you to distribute technology to a much tighter, smaller, more interconnected empire, okay? Uh, so that would reduce uh, empire size from planets, which benefits people who might have a ton of planets. Not the most interesting. There are some other things in here that are worth looking at and considering. Uh, we'll get into envoys in a future tutorial. That feels like that's my tagline in this tutorial because there's so much to teach you. But, uh, but the options aren't that particularly interesting. When you add DLCs to Solaris, one of the coolest things is you get access to a bunch more Ascension perks. And you might be thinking to yourself like, okay, oh, like these are kind of boring, like so what? But the Ascension perks that come from DLCs give you the ability to build mega structures. You can build a Dyson sphere around a star. And in so doing, you generate the star energy, converting it into literal energy for your empire. That's pretty sweet. You can build gigantic ships or colossi that you can wield against your opponents and literally destroy planets, crack them in half, obliterate all life on them. Or you could build a colossi that actually creates a shield around a planet and prevents people from ever going in or out of that planet ever again, pacifies it entirely. There's a lot of different routes that you can go with that. The Ascension perks also include decisions in DLCs, like the ability to create psionic population. Tap into psionic powers, and now all of your population have literal psychic powers. It's pretty cool. Or you can have a Ascension perk 
that your people not only re uh, replace their body parts with bionic body parts, but they start to replace their vital organs and their brains and their exoskeletons. And you can turn your normally squishy population into literal robot AI with a sentient human brain inside of a robotic body. It's really cool. There are a ton, a ton, a ton of additions that you will get, especially in the Ascensions perks, but across the entire gameplay experience that are unlocked from DLC. I'll probably do a DLC tier list and like order that I would recommend, especially now that Overlord is out and, and, uh, and out there in the world. But until that comes out, know that picking up a DLC or two can really change your experience in the game for good. Doing so may invalidate your saves. So just keep that in mind. As you add DLC to the game, it may invalidate some of your saves. It may make things a little bit a little bit tricky to, to manage from one save to the next. So just keep that in mind. If you've got an empire and a playthrough that you really love, you may want to finish that before adding a bunch of DLC on top of it. But really consider, especially if you want to broaden your experience in Solaris, consider picking up some DLC. They will change the way that you look at Ascension perks 100%. That said, for this tutorial, I don't have any of the DLCs installed. So instead, I'm just gonna take, and I would actually take the same thing, DLCs or not. Uh, technological Ascendancy, it's really good. It's really good. Remember, you will get a new Ascension perk every single time you finish a tradition tree. And in fact, we sat on so much unity that we can unlock a new tree. So in the tradition selection screen, I can now go through and choose a new tradition. Maybe I wanna take the expansion tradition because I wanna have a really massive empire that's super, super wide, that has a bunch of systems, a bunch of planets, a bunch of people in it, and I wanna do that as fast as possible. Expansion is probably the tree that you wanna take. Maybe I know that I wanna destroy my neighbors, I wanna wipe them off the face of the galaxy, I wanna destroy them now. Supremacy might be the tradition that you wanna take. Maybe I'm not focused on expansion. I want to build very tall. And to build tall, I have to have even more resources in my small amount of planets and my small amount of systems than anyone else. I might take the prosperity tree to increase the benefit from within my empire. There's a lot of different options for you to choose. You'll notice that harmony actually matches the unity icon. I wonder why that is. Interesting. And uh, you can mix and match these and play around with them based on how you want to play the game. For us, I'll probably take, for the sake of being able to show you a lot of the different elements in the game, I'm probably going to take the diplomacy tree because, hey, we want to extend a, a branch to our neighbors. We want to meet new Xenos. We want to meet new, new populations out there. So I'm going to grab diplomacy and adopt that. The sooner I do that, the sooner I can do some of the, so the, the interesting di diplomatic elements of the game. But first we gotta find some aliens out there, which we still haven't done because my survey, uh, survey vessels have been kind of paused here while I've been explaining different concepts. So I'm gonna take my, my vessels and go out and survey this way. Last thing here, I wanna explain one last thing. What was it? We were looking at traditions. Ah, policies. Remember how we had to wait 10 years to change our first contact protocol? Well, 10 years have passed. And the Xeno Justice Group still wants us to have proactive first contact protocols. And we can do that now, finally, because the time has passed. So we're gonna go into the policies tab. We're gonna open up the first contact protocol. And I'm gonna change our policy for how we greet new aliens. We're gonna change it to proactive. This is what we've been asked to do by one of our factions. Now, you don't have to do this, but it would actually benefit us to do it and it doesn't really harm us that much. So we'll change our policy and you'll notice that if we go back to our faction, one of the red pips has turned green because we have fulfilled that expectation of them. And what we probably should have done is check to see whether the Democratic Rights Committee had a an opposing policy, right? They have a larger portion of our population that supports them. But lucky for us, these two don't really compete in too many different things. In fact, we can do one and bang it out right of the park right now. Both of them want us to enact the benevolent subjugation policy. That is, if we subjugate any other species, 
Our goal is actually to be benevolent to them. We want to uplift them and improve them. And we can do that in the policies panel, just like we did the first contact protocol. And we can change this to benevolent. Pretty easy ask for us to do because it benefits both of our factions. And you'll notice maybe that our unity increase from both factions has increased by a little bit, but it's a little bit every single month. And that adds up a lot. So quick recap, we looked at the value of trade power and how to gather trade. We looked at factions and what factions do for you and how to keep them supportive of you by changing your policies. We looked a little bit at what effect changing policies has on your empire and how that shifts stuff like what you generate and uh, how you even engage with other empires out there in space. And we also look at ascendancy perks and what those look like when you finish a tradition tree. That was a lot. In our next tutorial, let's take a look at diplomacy. I'll probably play a little bit more of the game. We'll probably get ourselves caught up to the point that we probably should have been you know, this, this long in, honestly, 16 years in, I've been in tutorial mode, not in min-maxing the gameplay mode. And we are going to take a look at how you can engage with other alien species out there in the galaxy. Until then, I hope you enjoyed the tutorial. Let me know down in the comments if there's anything I missed or anything you want more explanation about, and I will see you in the next one. See you soon.